It is year 1976, August 1976, and I am driving across the George Washington Bridge with my dog on the way to Kalamazoo, Michigan. And it is hot. It is very, very hot. And so I am wearing the least that I can to keep myself decent. And because it was 1976, I have to tell you that I looked a little different. <laughs> that things that I didn't want to fall off or fall out, like my hair and my teeth, had not yet fallen off or out. And things that I didn't want to come on, like weight and wrinkles and rolls of fat, hadn't yet come on. So I looked okay. <laughs> and I was really annoyed because of those truckers. You know, to begin with, the trucks, when they come by you, they go whoosh, and they, they scoot you into the side of the road so that you have to really grab your wheel so that you're not going to be thrown onto the side or the wall of whatever it is, where, whichever level of George Washington Bridge you're driving on. But it's not so much the trucks themselves, it's the truckers. Here they are, they're passing me, but they're not passing me. They're staying level with me, and they're giving me the thumbs up, and they're leering down at my bosom, they're leering down at my knees, my legs. They're laughing, they're giving me the high five, they're hooting their horns, and I am angry, because this is sexist. <laughs> they would not do this if I was 70, unfortunately. <laughs> they wouldn't do it if I was, I was a man, probably. So this is sexist. But if you're driving to Kalamazoo, you have to drive on Route 80 through New Jersey, through Pennsylvania, and then I can't even remember where you go after that, but it, it is boring and the exits don't come very often, and the further you get into New Jersey, and then as you begin to get into Pennsylvania, they happen less and less and less, and it's very hard to keep any emotion going because it is so incredibly boring. And I discover, as one does, any of you that have taken a long distance trip, that there is a green Toyota and my little blue Vega that I'm driving. <laughs> one is passing the other, and then the other is passing one. You know, you're right. yes. you know how that yes. happens? Yes. And it isn't so much about the driver. It really is as, as if the cars have made a decision that they're going to pal up for this incredibly boring journey. And it was a green Toyota. In my case, it was a green Toyota. So we were doing the pit-pat rhythm of pass and, and be passed. And then I looked at the speedometer and I am doing 80 miles an hour. Now, 80 miles an hour in 1976 is taboo. For those of you that were alive in 1976, you may remember that the speed limit on all interstates was 55 miles per hour. And I thought, you know what? It really is not gonna make that much of a difference of getting to Kalamazoo whether I do 55 or 80, and I don't want to get a ticket. I am going to slow down. Bye-bye, Toyota. And so I slowed down, and then two minutes later, I thought, well, that's strange. The green Toyota had slowed down, too. Only it hadn't. I look at the speedometer, and I am still going 80 miles per hour, and I have not touched the accelerator for at least two minutes. <laughs> Odd. So those of you that have been in this cir circumstance where you're going too fast, the first thing you do is put your foot on the brake. Bad mistake. I could smell the rubber instantly. I said, well, that's not going to work. But luckily, there had been an incident in my childhood for those of you that remember the 1950s, there was a hot, steamy novel called Peyton Place. Yeah, yeah. yeah you remember it? Yeah. And yeah. And my six year older sister was reading Peyton Place. And I still believe to this day that my parents and she worked out a plan to encourage me to read. I was an incredibly slow developer and slow learner. I would much rather 
hear the grass grow than read a book. And so they told me that I was not to read this novel. And then they hid it in plain sight. <laughs> so, of course, I read it, thereby improving my learning. Now, in Peyton Place, there happens to be an individual who is stuck in a car and he cannot slow it down because the accelerator is stuck. And I said, I knew there was a reason I had to read this book. My accelerator is stuck. And so I jiggle it with my foot, 80 miles an hour. And somehow, God knows how, angel looking out for me, I reach down and I jiggle it with my hand and there's nothing there. There's absolutely nothing there. I'm making no effect whatsoever. I am still going 80 miles per hour and now I'm beginning to think, what the hell do I do? So I turned off the engine, right? Because then you can just coast to the side of the road. What I did not know is in an automatic, if you turn off the engine and you're going fast enough, it jump starts again and <laughs> off I go again. <laughs> which I don't want to do, so I say, what on earth do I do? Driving on Route 80, if I put the car in neutral and turn off the engine, I can coast to the side of the road. Why didn't I think of that? And then I think that the exits on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, or wherever it was, Route 80, if that's the turnpike, are, are very few and far between. I have been driving like this for who knows how long, not knowing it, being quite happy with my green Toyota in front of me and passing it and so on. So I say, look, just keep driving at 80 miles an hour till you come to the green two mile exit sign and then go a little bit further, put the car in neutral and coast to the side of the road, by which time you'll be fairly close to an exit and there's always a gas station when you're close to an exit. Well, that resolve lasted about 30 seconds. I just could not do it. So what, what happens? What happens if I have to swerve away from another car? What happens if a policeman comes by and says I have to stop? I can't stop. So I put the car in neutral and turned the engine off and it's going like that. And I coast gently to the side of the road and stop and breathe a sigh of relief. I've stopped. I open the door, the dog <laughs> leaps out of the door. It was a Dalmatian and they're very, very nervy dogs. Goes across the road and the trucks and the cars are swerving, but luckily I managed to get her back and there is no terrible accident. And so I get the leash from the car and I go down the little ravine at the side of the road and tie her to the fence. And it was hot. It was really hot. So I'm thinking, oh, she might be thirsty. And so I go back to the car and I get the bowl and the bowl of water and I take it down the ravine to the fence. And then I think, she hasn't eaten for a long time. She might be hungry. And so I go back to the car and I get the bowl and I get the food that I brought and I pour it into the bowl and I go back and I give it to her. She doesn't look particularly hungry. Now you have to understand that all of this was because I do not know anything about cars. And so I was just trying to delay the inevitable of when I have to do something about this car and I have no idea what to do. But I do know that when your car is in trouble, you open the, the, um, the hood and you have that little stick thing that you put so your head doesn't get hurt. And I look and there are lots of black things. There's kind of metal round thing here and then a, a tube that looks a bit corrugated, but I have no idea what to do. And then I realize a trucker has stopped a little ahead of me. He comes walking back and says, do you need help? And I say, well, I really do. And I tell him what the problem is and turn the car in, on and he can hear it going. <laughs> And he says, turn it off, I think I know what to do. And he goes to his truck and he gets these huge pincers. And he comes, he disentangles a couple of wires and he pulls out, I swear, he pulled out a tooth. It was about this 
high and about this round. And if Vegas had teeth, this was a tooth. And he reconnects the wires and says, I don't think you'll have trouble anymore. You were stuck in overdrive. And indeed, I turn the car on, and it's a smooth little humming blue Vega again. It's lost its noise of a thousand bees. And I thank him profusely. And I say, look, let me pay you something. I, I didn't have a clue what to do. And he said, no, if my wife were stuck, I would hope that another trucker would stop and help her. And so I'm just paying it forward. Oh, and he didn't say paying it forward because we hadn't invented that expression yet. <laughs> and uh, so off he goes because I've got to get the dog and the bowls and everything and bring them back to the car, which I do. And I set off and I still have a lead foot even though I have no overdrive and I catch up with him and I'm overtaking him and I'm giving him the high five and I'm laughing, I'm giving him the thumbs up and I'm honking the horn. Isn't it strange how we can change our impression of a profession? <laughs> Thank you.